This program contains real and reenacted violent scenes of urban combat. Viewer discretion is advised. An American city is under siege. We've had some very large shootouts, but this was bigger than any of them. Two commando-style bank robbers ignite a savage shootout. These suspects were using AK-47 assault rifles. Wounded police and civilians are trapped in a war zone. When I was shot, I wasn't going to lay there and resign myself to death. I was going to fight. Now, the anatomy of the fiercest gun battle in U.S. police history. Shootout, the North Hollywood bank robbery. February 28, 1997. North Hollywood, located in the heart of the bank robbery capital of the world, Los Angeles. It's a high-stakes heist gone bad. An urban firefight that rivals battles in war-torn Iraq. It's one of the most violent shootouts in American police history. Television cameras on the ground and in the air capture the surreal scene live. Two paramilitary-style gunmen take over a bank using terrorist technology. Donning full body armor and automatic weapons, they charge out of a Bank of America branch in North Hollywood. With brutal and brazen disregard, they fire armor-piercing ammo into police and civilians. It was an all-out gun battle in the middle of a city street. They were there to kill people, and they didn't care who. Squad is being notified. Call three. All officers stay down. Shots are being fired from AK-47. There is an officer down. This is the first time in the history of the United States that suspects were robbing banks using armor-piercing rounds. A congested residential area turns into a combat zone. The shootout will end with deaths and dozens of injuries. And I thought that never to be possible because no one dies on my watch. And I thought, my God, how many people are we going to lose because of this bank robbery? The roots of the shootout trace back to 1989. Larry Phillips Jr. meets Emil Matasarano, working out at Gold's Gym in Venice, California. Starving to strike it rich, they pump up for a lawless life. Larry already has a long rap sheet. He orchestrated a few real estate scams and was prosecuted for grand theft. Emil Matasarano, an immigrant from Romania, is an unsuccessful software consultant. They actually did train together, not only with weapons, but physical training. Um, and they were both very secretive. Uh, they told very little about themselves to anybody. In October 1993, Glendale, California police pull over Phillips and Matasaranu and discover an arsenal of weapons in their vehicle. After a plea bargain and three months in jail, the two gun fanatics petition the court and retrieve their weapons. By 1996, Phillips makes Matasaranu a partner in his next scheme, robbing banks. I think they found something that they were good at, and this might have been the only thing they were real good at. In May of 1996, they robbed two Bank of America branches in the San Fernando Valley and sees over one and a half million dollars. It's all caught on videotape. They were takeover bandits. They would uh, not pass a note. They wouldn't bother with the tellers. They would walk in, uh, shoot a number of rounds into the ceiling, force everybody to the ground. They stormed the bank wearing masks and uh, some type of uh, protective armor underneath it and obtained a large amount of money for, for a normal bank robbery at that time. Nine months pass before the thugs plot their next heist. The Bank of America in North Hollywood. This particular branch is located at 6600 Laurel Canyon Boulevard, a busy thoroughfare near the 170 freeway. 
There are two large parking lots on the bank's north and south side. Residential homes run along the back of the bank. Across the street are many commercial businesses and restaurants. They did some research. They staked out and observed the bank and observed the armored car drop-offs and pickups. And they also observed the interior of the bank because they knew exactly where the door was, which was the entrance to behind the counter and into the vaulted areas. February 28, 1997. The robbers dressed to kill. Phillips dons 43 pounds of body armor made of Kevlar, a woven substance which is five times stronger than steel. He painstakingly sewed together his body armor, which covers the top of his neck down to his ankles. Matasaranu sloppily made his armor, which doesn't cover his arms and legs. However, he inserts a trauma plate into the front of his Kevlar vest to protect vital organs. You can't buy that body armor. They made it. That shows a lot of planning. The most chilling elements of their plan are the weapons. They assemble three AK-47s with 100 round ammo drums. One M16 fully automatic Bushmaster rifle. An HK-91 assault rifle, illegally modified to be fully automatic. Two 9mm handguns and a 38 caliber revolver. They were familiar with automatic weapons through the books and things that they read. They also load up with close to 3,000 rounds, including armor-piercing ammo, the kind that can penetrate cars, not to mention bulletproof vests, from 200 yards away. Their strategy? Outgun and out-armor the cops. They had the firepower and the number of rounds that they put down range to uh, do extremely uh, devastating damage. The robbers also wear gloves with stopwatches sewn in them. They got this idea from the film Heat, which features a bank robbery. They will follow the eight minute rule, the max amount of time spent in the bank. They've determined this is typically how long it takes cops to respond to a robbery. Approximately 8.30 a.m. From their Van Nuys safe house, the bandits head east toward North Hollywood in a white Chevrolet celebrity. Emil was the follower, Larry was the leader, right? Two complete psychos. Phillips and Matasaranu pull into the Bank of America's North parking lot. While waiting for the bank to open, they both swallow the barbiturate phenobarbital, a muscle relaxant. 9 a.m., Bank of America is open for business. Nine seventeen a.m., officers Lauren Farrell and Martin Perillo just happen to be cruising by. They witness two masked men entering the bank. It's a rare but fortuitous moment. They call for backup. Larry Phillips and Emil Matasaranu storm into the bank. Armed with fully automatic AK-47s, they fire numerous rounds at the ceiling and order everyone to the floor. Definitely a takeover technique, but unlike anything that I'd ever seen, this particular branch had what we call bandit barriers in it, which are glass partitions that go from the counters to the ceilings. With their high-powered weaponry, they were able to uh, shoot open the lock that gained access back there. Phillips forces the bank manager into the vault to fill their money bag. When he sees only small denomination bills, he releases a burst of automatic fire. Larry became immediately enraged and yelled out, where's the money, where's the rest of the money? I know you have more money in this bank. And they didn't, because he altered the delivery schedule. Undaunted, Phillips heads to the bank's ATM machine for more cash. Uh, 
uh, they tried to get the branch manager to open that ATM. Policies had been changed and the branch manager no longer had access to the ATM cash. This robbery is far from routine. It will become nothing short of a full-scale military battle. Nine twenty-five a.m. North Hollywood, California. Two gun-toting maniacs, Larry Phillips and Emil Matasaranu, are violently seizing cash at a Bank of America branch. They're wielding AK-47s, among the deadliest of assault rifles. Outside, Los Angeles police officers from the North Hollywood and surrounding divisions arrive. They set up roadblocks and move civilians out of a potential strike zone. All officers were securing the perimeter and attempting to keep traffic from coming or going. 15 to 20 officers position themselves around the inner perimeter of the bank, known as the Circle of Fire. One of the officers is James Aborovet, who's been out of the police academy for only two months. All the training was kicking in. I was thinking about policy and procedure, tactics. You're looking for uh, tactical superiority. You're looking around you for structures that will provide cover if there is gunfire. Officer Zaborovan and his training partner, Stuart Guy, find cover behind a locksmith kiosk located across the street from the bank. They hunker down alongside detectives Tracy Angelus and John Krulak. Because we were one of the first people to arrive on the location, they were asking for someone to cover the front of the bank, which we elected to do. We thought we had a couple of guys in the bank with nothing but handguns, so we felt pretty secure being across the street behind the kiosk, which is about 50 yards from the bank. My partner and myself had body armor. Unbeknownst to us at the time, the gunman inside had, you know, AK-47s that our body armor does not stop. North Hollywood detectives and officers find cover around the back of the bank. The strategy in all of these things is to contain uh, the suspects at a, a location, control the situation, and uh, attempt to take them into custody, whether through negotiations or their absolute surrender. Officer Martin Whitfield, six years on the job, and veteran Sergeant Dean Haynes deploy themselves in the intersection closest to the bank's north door. Personnel are requesting a unit to safely position their in front of the front door. 9.25 a.m. After approximately eight minutes, the gunmen abandoned the heist with a little over $300,000. They had expected to clear over $750,000, like they had in the previous robberies. Larry Phillips emerges from the bank's north door. Emil Matasaranu exits from the south door. Wearing combat fatigues and clutching AK-47s, they look ready for battle. Phillips eyes police blocking the northwest intersection of Laurel Canyon and Archwood. I believe Phillips was surprised. Uh, he wasn't scared. He saw a police car in the intersection at Laurel Canyon and Archwood. It was Sergeant Dean Haynes and a few civilians. Phillips raised his uh, AK-47 and began firing at the police car. Bullets penetrate Sergeant Dean Haynes' vehicle, causing it to violently shake. Fluids pour out everywhere. I don't think they were skilled at firing. They were more or less spray and pray, as they say, shoot at anything that moved, and that's what they were trying to do. Armor-piercing bullets continue to rip into Sergeant Haynes' black and white. One bullet strikes a male civilian in the chest. A woman suffers an ankle wound. Suddenly, Sergeant Haynes is hit in the left shoulder. Matasaranu sprays fire in all directions. At the same time, Phillips targets the locksmith kiosk directly across the street from the bank. 
There, Detectives John Krulak and Tracy Angelus, along with Officers James Zaborovan and Stuart Guy, fire at Phillips, then quickly take cover. 